Peoria is a celebrated place in show business lore. You know, a lot of people in New York don't think that Peoria really exists. Uh, like they don't think Oshkosh exists either. My friends in New York uh, might say, you must be from Oshkosh if I act like a hick, which I often do. Or uh, how will it play in Peoria? If they mean what is the average concert or playgoer going to think? Well, both Peoria and Oshkosh are very real. Almost as real as Fargo, North Dakota, where I come from. Peoria is the heartland of Illinois. And most people around here would tell you that Illinois is the heartland of America. Sure looks like it to me. I've written a piece of music for three of my old friends, and we're here in Peoria to see how it plays. first if you want to. We'll start out with the works, we'll do it, if not, we'll stop. Oh. <laughs> Except for that one measure, the measure before H, where I came in a bar early, that was pretty good. Pretty good. Yada yada. <laughs> How was that? Well, he said it. Oh, he said we can go? Okay. Yeah, we'll just do it again, I think. Straight through. Straight through. Straight through. <laughs> That's the nice thing about a rehearsal. <laughs> my old pal Walter Fairdare, his wife Elsa, and their friend Gary. You know, when the Beatles added a 105-piece symphony orchestra to rock and roll, they changed everything. And in a more modest way, I think what the Fairdare trio is involved in is sort of the same thing, the making of a medium. I guess it's lucky that Walter just had a couple of friends who played clarinet and piano instead of a whole symphony orchestra. We'd have trouble getting them on this bus. trio, of course, consists of, of violin, clarinet, and piano, which is a, a very delightful combination in my mind. And so I was very happy when they commissioned the piece that's going to be played tonight. How do you feel about uh, your program of, of new music for this, uh, as far as I'm concerned, underused combination in the past? Um, do you sort of hew to one stylistic avenue, or do you try to cover a lot of bases? No, actually we're convinced that uh, this combination of instruments has the potential to, to be a, a real personality in the music world. Uh, the way the string quartet, of course, has been the most prominent one, and the uh, piano trio with violin and cello, uh, woodwind quintet and brass quintet, and so forth. And so we, we felt that uh, the thing we had to do was to, to get the most talented composers from every stylistic direction that's, that's happening in the United States and in the world uh, today. I can't say we have every single right, one, right. but... You but, haven't commissioned the Beastie Boys. That's right. right. No, right. <laughs> but Actually, I'd like to uh, add to this just a little bit. Uh, in a sense, what we think we're doing is creating a new medium. Uh, we've commissioned so many works for this combination. And one of our projects also is to have these works published. So really, in a sense, uh, our CDs and our recordings, as well as the uh, television tapes, uh, are just to make these pieces accessible. And of course, if they're not published, then they won't be 
available to the public. So that's just one more avenue that um, we want to Great. explore yeah, as well. To make them yeah. available in every way. So. I mean, music is a language, uh, just like all art is a language, and, and sometimes people are put off because they don't understand the vocabulary. And uh, so I try to tell people to be patient and, and try and learn it. And then if you don't like it, right. <laughs> then... But the fact is, there is so much new music uh, of such variety, and people somehow assume it's all going to be just the dissonant uh, music right. that they don't think they're going to like. And I think if there's anything we're trying to also prove in all our commissioning efforts is that there's such a wide diversity and such a variety that you're bound to find some new music you like, and you mustn't just put it away and decide not to ever listen right. to any. And no, that's you, what we hope to prove. You yeah. certainly do cover the waterfront. Yes, we do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I've always felt that uh, it would have been so great to, to see some of the great composers of the past, you know, in person. You, you wonder how they, how they looked, really, not just photographs or paintings, but how they looked, the, their voice and so forth. And so, so I think television is such a wonderful medium for them. Might have been a disappointment in some cases. Yeah, I'm not true. sure that Beethoven well, was probably, really a, yeah. a cheerful companion. <laughs> <Yeah>. uh, <laughs> but, in other words, eventually people will consider this a medium that uh, has a great deal of repertoire and uh, they will be able to see the uh, tapes or and hear, for instance, what the composers have to say. I mean, it's going to be terrific for someone working on your trio to hear what you thought of when you wrote the piece or even how it came to, into being, which is rather a nice story. Right. Uh, no, I, I mean, I agree with you. I think it is nice. Uh, some people don't have that attitude. Uh, uh, a violinist once told me when I was very young, when I suggested a change of phrasing in one of my own pieces, she turned to me and she said, we usually prefer it when the composer is dead. <laughs> and so I, I found out what the attitude was early on of, of most people. Yeah. But I agree with you, and I, as a matter of fact, I always try to, uh, in a concert of my music, I always uh, introduce the pieces verbally because I think people are interested in seeing that the composers are real live people who might be eating next to you even at McDonald's, you know? <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's right. yeah. <laughs> the program note for the Mozart pieces that began the program mentions that Mozart loved to dance himself. And uh, my own feeling is that a lot of the classical concert music written during the last half of this century has sort of lost that kinetic energy, that dance feeling, uh, which is very important to me. And in this, uh, the serenade for three, the first movement uh, is called Dances, and it's a bunch of different, different themes, uh, all of them different kind of dance movements. There's a lot of, of uh, jazz influence in, in some of the licks. Then the second movement is a complete opposite of being very quiet and very uh, lyric in a, in a sort of a serene kind of way. And then the last movement has a rather interesting history. Uh, Walter Ferdera was driving along in his car one time on his way to a meeting or something, and he was listening to the radio, and he heard what he at first thought was, was country music. Which is, uh, and uh, I heard this this music which I thought I'd hit a country western station because it was a, it sounded like a cowboy song. And uh, so I was about to turn it off, and then I heard something about, my name is Oedipus Tex. My friends, they call me Ed. And uh, anyway, I became fascinated. It was, it was a terrific piece. It got funnier and funnier. And, and the music was beautiful. I thought, gee, who, who is this? And um, I should have known, but uh, at the end it was, Peter Schickerly. No, it was PDQ Bach. PDQ Bach. <laughs> <Excuse me. laughs> right. Absolutely right. <laughs> and so the, the, after the concert, I went home and I, I sat down and I, I wrote uh, I wrote you a letter and uh, asked if you would consider writing a piece for it. <laughs> so when Walter talked to me about commissioning a piece uh, for the group, he, he mentioned that. But uh, in spite of the fact that PDQ Bach is the only dead composer who can still be commissioned, uh, I wasn't in a place at that moment where I, I was interested in doing, uh, in doing another PDQ Bach discovery. Uh, I had just done a, a bunch of them and I, I really needed a, 
a change of pace, I felt. And so I said I'd, I'd rather write a Peter Shickley piece. And uh, his story led me to something that was a first for me, uh, which is Peter Shickley writing variations on a theme by PDQ Bach. <laughs> so uh, it's a fairly incestuous last movement. <laughs> And this movement uh, sort of pulls out all the stops. I mean, it certainly has a lot of dance quality, but it, uh, it lets in a lot of my favorite kinds of music, uh, country fiddling, boogie-woogie, piano. It's all in there. Some of these things uh, 30, 40 years ago would have really been considered, you just don't do that in concert music. I mean, there was a real knitted brow seriousness in those days, which I'm happy to say uh, is evaporating in these days and uh, the doors are much more open now than they were there for a while. So here is Serenade for Three.
they say, whoever they are, that you can't mix funny and sad in the same piece of music. You know, that if it doesn't have the same sort of seriousness all the way through, that it isn't right. But people don't expect that in books or movies or plays. When was the last time you read a mystery that didn't have some good laughs in it along the way? Why can't a piece of music be like life in general? Sometimes sad, sometimes funny, sometimes dramatic, sometimes calm. The people here in the heartland don't need a book or even me to tell them that. The seasons tell them that with the planting and the growing and the harvesting and the deep sleep of winter. After which comes spring, which turns into one big raucous dance. That's my favorite ending for a piece, sustained applause. The Fairdare Trio, aren't they something? New life for a very old musical form. And will it play in Peoria? I think you can hear the answer for yourself. Gee, if I feel like Carl Sagan in this thing, maybe I'll fly over to Fargo. Uh, miss, is there a meal on this flight? Well, some peanuts maybe?